Welcome to Critical Thinking, Unit 4 Concepts. Today we will ask what is rhetoric, manipulation, and honest persuasion. We'll also cover the parts of persuasion. I'm not going to repeat your required reading from the textbook and study guide, but I'm going to encourage you to read those carefully for yourself. What I am going to do is give you additional tools to help you make sense of it all in a simple way. First off, rhetoric. The definition of rhetoric given in your study guide is the art of influencing people through language. Some examples are rhetoric is used in speeches or advertisements, TV and movies, propaganda and manipulation, as well as honest persuasion. Some examples from the study guide are rhetorical devices, euphemisms and dysphemisms, rhetorical definitions, stereotypes, innuendo, and loaded questions. But I think it's important to stop and ask, what is the difference between manipulation and honest persuasion? Well, manipulation appeals to emotion and not reason. The goal is to control and deceive others for personal gain. The means is to manipulate without letting people think for themselves. Now, it's important to note that manipulation is not just an unfamiliar opinion or an opinion you don't like. I like to say that we have a natural allergy for new and different ideas. If we're never humble and respectful, honestly listening to someone else's point of view, then we will never know whether we are going to be stuck in our own problems. The only way to change and to solve problems is to listen to unfamiliar and different ideas. Remember, we're always going to have a natural resistance to new ideas, whether they're good or bad. Manipulation is not just an unfamiliar opinion or an opinion you don't like. By contrast, honest persuasion appeals to emotion and reason. The goal is to share wisdom for the other person's benefit. And the means is that it appeals to reason and lets people think for themselves. Honest persuasion is care for the other person. It's trying to have good reasons. In other words, I'm trying to help the other person be a critical thinker by leading them in wisdom, giving them a piece of wisdom, or trying to help them see a bit of wisdom. I'm not trying to deceive or manipulate them. Now, we can ask why are the following examples manipulation or honest persuasion. A medication advertisement claims to be all natural and to help digestion. When you buy it, you notice strange chemicals listed and the side effects include likely internal bleeding. Is this manipulation or honest persuasion? Well, even if the advertisement did not lie, this is manipulation because it uses language to appear healthy, but its goal is to deceive. It says things like all natural, and it has pictures of plants and healthy people, different things like this to make it appear healthy. Its goal is to deceive. And also remember that all natural may not mean healthy. After all, snake venom is natural. The lesson to take away here is that you need to think for yourself and look deeper than appearances. Now, a politician and a news reporter express fear and urgency, telling us that there is a virus spreading across the country. They say we should all get vaccinated immediately. You learn elsewhere that the virus has already been contained. Is this manipulation or honest persuasion? Although the politician and reporter are mistaken, it is still honest persuasion because their motives were good. They just happen to be wrong. Doesn't mean it's manipulation just because they're wrong. They were honestly trying to persuade. The lesson, again, is think for yourself and look deeper than appearances. I'm sure that you can come up with a bunch of examples on your own. Just remember the principles for manipulation and honest persuasion. Now, is it ever okay to manipulate? No, manipulation is immoral because it's deceptive. Manipulation seeks to undermine someone's critical thinking. I often get asked, is parenting manipulation? Even if you are not a parent, 
you have had a parent, and this paradigm will certainly apply in different kinds of contexts. Perhaps when you're thinking about the law, or when you're thinking about an employer. Is parenting manipulation yes if you intentionally lie or deceive, but no if you're helping teach children how to think well? If children disobey, parents discipline their kids to teach them what is good for them. Rewards and discipline build wise habits. Hopefully the kids will eventually mature to understand wisdom and make good choices on their own. The law is the same, ideally anyway. The goal is to teach wisdom through effective tactics. Do not subvert wisdom through manipulative tactics. Right, so there's a clear difference here. There's different kinds of parenting styles where you can manipulate or you can use honest persuasion. And rewards and punishments don't necessarily tell you if this is manipulation or if it is honest persuasion because rewards and punishments are rhetorical tactics that can be used for good or for evil. Let's talk about the parts of persuasion. This is getting a little bit more in depth. This is perhaps the most useful critical thinking tool I have ever found. The parts of persuasion are ethos, pathos, and logos. The philosopher Aristotle said that of the modes of persuasion furnished by the spoken word, there are three kinds. The first kind depends on the personal character of the speaker, ethos. The second on putting the audience into a certain frame of mind, pathos. The third, on the proof or apparent proof provided by the words of the speech itself, logos. So here's how we can think of this. First off, ethos is trust. Remember T. And pathos is an appeal to emotion, E. And logos is logic, L. We can remember this acronym. This is when someone tells you something, T-E-L, trust, emotion, and logic. These are three aspects of every act of communication. Whether you read something, or see an advertisement, or hear a song, any act of communication, you can think about it through these three different principles. Now, in order of persuasion, trust comes first. Trust is the most persuasive of these three different aspects. And then comes emotion, and then logic. Now, in terms of critical thinking, it goes in a reverse order. Logic, emotion, and trust. Let's illustrate that with an example. So, there could be, let's say, a commercial. This is an example of an old commercial that featured the Hulk and Ant-Man in a Coca-Cola commercial a few years back. This can also apply to a political ad or social media or anything else. First off, let's think about trust, all right? So the advertisement will use recognizable celebrities and name brand recognition. It's appealing to your sense of trust. You already trust that these characters will provide pleasure and that this is a trusted name brand. If they build this recognition through posting their logo on the sides of billboards or in Super Bowl commercials or on the side of a race car, this builds familiarity. That way, when you're in the store and you see Coca-Cola right next to Buffalo Bill's orange soda, you're probably going to pick Coca-Cola. The purpose is that we tend to choose familiar over strange, so advertisements try to build familiarity. Next, emotion. Pathos. Advertisements use pictures of a beautiful product and good acting, maybe a nice environment and music. They seek to entertain with action or humor. This is where our rhetorical strategies, rhetorical devices often come in, this appeal to emotion. The purpose here is to create a positive emotional association. Next comes logic. For something like a TV advertisement, it's often very minimal because the most persuasive aspect of communication is going to be trust and emotion. And really, they want to create an emotional association. They don't really want us to think for themselves. So, in this particular commercial, the tagline is, Sometimes you just want a little Coca-Cola. Because they were advertising miniature Coca-Cola cans. Often there's no logos aspect. There's very little message or argumentation. 
It's just about recognizable name brand. The purpose here for advertisers is that they know trust and emotion are more persuasive than logic. They don't want you to think for yourself, right? So we learn to think for ourselves with critical thinking. The same can happen in social media, news, movies, politics, or at work. When someone does not want you to think critically, when they don't want you to choose for yourself, they will try to spin a story or use emotional appeals or manipulative tactics or rhetorical devices in order to subvert your critical thinking skills and try to make the choice for you. This happens way more often than we realize because the appeal to emotion often happens without our realizing it since its goal is to sidestep our intellect and our reason. But as we grow with critical thinking skills, we can catch those things and learn to think for ourselves. So what does the critical thinker do? The critical thinker is going to go in the reverse direction. Start off with logic. Right? What is my goal, need, problem, or desire? What is their idea? Do they have reasons that I actually agree with? The purpose here is wisdom. I want to have good reasons for beliefs and actions. An idea or belief is true if it corresponds to reality, not if it appeals to my emotions. How will the critical thinker think about pathos, the emotional aspect? The critical thinker will ask, do they sound reasonable? If I don't know, I move to pathos, right? So that's thinking about logic. Right. If, they're, if we don't know if they're logical, I move to pathos and ask, do they appeal to my desires? Are they friendly or abrasive? In other words, we're trying to figure out, are they interested in something that's going to benefit me, or are they just trying to get something out of me? Do their motives show that they are interested in honest persuasion, something that's good for me, or is it a manipulative tactic? The purpose is to distinguish between manipulation and honest persuasion, and to catch logical fallacies. Next, how does the critical thinker think about trust? Well, we don't want blind trust. Do I believe everything they say, no matter what? We want reasonable trust. Do I have good reasons to trust them? Think about a political environment. Think about a candidate that you like. Do you believe everything they say no matter what? Think about a candidate on the other side, right? Do you distrust everything they say no matter what? This is blind trust and blind distrust. What about reasonable trust? Do I have good reasons to trust them? If they say something wrong, will I catch it? Do I turn my brain off when I listen to them? Or am I always thinking critically as I listen to both people I like and people I don't like? Have they earned my respect? Do I have enough humility to admit that someone I do not like may have a good idea? Or that someone I like may have a bad idea? The purpose here is to base my beliefs on wisdom and not blind trust. And to think outside the box. To think for myself. And to avoid being swept away by mob mentality, trends, and fads. Remember. Persuasion and critical thinking go in opposite directions. And so those who seek to manipulate will try to appeal to emotion and sidestep or subvert the logical and critical thinking aspect. So we want to ask, is the goal of this other person or advertisement, is the goal to get something out of me or is the goal to give me something that will benefit me? Are they trying to help me think well, or are they trying to help me not think? Do they want me to make my own choice, or do they want to make the choice for me? Thank you for joining me, and be sure to contact me with any questions that you have.